Welcome to the Peace of Authenticity podcast. I'm Aubrey. I'm Jordan. And this is Gray. And we are the Andersons. Thank you so much for continuing to support our podcast here on YouTube. And we're just so thankful that you're on here and you're joining in on the conversation with us. We really hope and pray that this encourages you and inspires you to draw closer to our Lord and that you have an awesome time chatting with us. Hey, everybody. What's going on, guys? So this one, we have a lot of stuff, so we're going to have to like just cut to the we're chase. Just, we're just going to have to get it. Um, it's really good, and, and all of the stuff that we have found out and studied, we really just want to get it all in. Yeah. So, so if you're just now joining oh, yeah. in on the <laughs> on the podcast today, um, then I suggest that you go back to last week's and kind yes. of watch. We're going through all the lenses on how to read the Bible in its original context. And so I, I don't want you to miss out mm -hmm. on step one and then just, I mean, you can hang in here for step two if I you can. want to, but um, just remember there was a first one. Last week we talked about historical information that kind of mm -hmm. brings everything out of like, you know, the history of the context of where the scripture was at that time. And so now this week we're going to be talking about cultural yes. lenses. And so um, in, in the ebook that we talked about last week, yeah. Um, we will put the link yet again in the show notes. Every single week of this six-week series, we are going to put it in the show notes. And we also have really exciting news. The guy that actually wrote the book, the ebook, Brad Gray, he's amazing. Like, we totally look up to him in the way that he looks at scripture. Like, we're going to have him on. Yeah, he's coming on the podcast, y'all. It's like Christmas in yeah. August is what I, it's I could be. I couldn't even hardly believe it <laughs> whenever we found out yesterday that he agreed to be on our podcast, I was totally just. We're so excited. Whoa, Honestly, let's go. he's gonna blow your minds with some of the some yeah. of the wisdom the Lord's given him. But okay, so we talk about the cultural, right? And so um, he said this is a massive lens, okay? And there's different um, significant. He called them cultural pigment colorings in the biblical stories that are in scripture, right? And so there's a few. We're not gonna go in depth, but we will if we address them while we're talking. Yeah. Um, there's honor and shame. That's one. There's Hellenism, um, tribal society, agrarian society, and village life. The temple was the center of Jewish life and the rabbinic, rabbinical world. Okay. And so those are them. And of course, this ebook, you just click on it and you can read this. You know what I mean? Yeah. You go in depth. So, yeah, you don't have to pay for nothing. He, get, he in put it out there for free. Cultural. Yes, which is like so awesome. We've read it multiple times. Yeah. So, okay. So, Going back into Brad's book for a second, there are six questions. Mm -hmm. There's in the book. I mean, if you if you click on it and you go through and read it, it's a, it's a really fast read, guys. Like mm -hmm. each one of these lenses, you can go through there, and he just breaks it down. It's so simple. It kind of feels like the old commercials. It's so easy a caveman can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's so cool. But there's six questions that you need to ask yourself. When you're asking questions, when you're reading scripture and you're and you're wanting to know more about cultural things regarding that text, mm -hmm. there's this one, there's the first one. Is this in Jewish context? Is it Roman, Egyptian, Babylonian, etc.? Who what yeah. context are we reading this through? What lens mm -hmm. are we trying to read this through? Like for instance, if if you're reading a letter from Paul mm -hmm. and you know, obviously Romans you, yeah. you're, you're looking through the Roman lens, right? Like Paul their was culture. writing to mm -hmm. Romans, so he was referencing their culture. Yeah. Um, so, and then you have to realize if it is it Jewish culture or is it wh where are we at? Mm -hmm. So that's question number one. Number two is how is the context, whether it be Jewish, Roman, etc., impacting the story? How does it impact the story? And it does in a huge yeah, way. Yeah, every time. Every yeah. time it does. So number three, what cultural clues are given explicitly in the passage? Mm. Okay? There, there will be markers in the passage of Scripture to tell you what culture you're dealing with, where it's at. And it, and it all just, all everything that we're doing here is just bringing more fun even for us in studying scripture because you're you're studying different people and uh jordan and i actually went to israel mm -hmm. and it was quite a culture shock i oh, mean yeah, it, as far as being in <laughs> israel and eating the food that they eat and doing everything like that it was a huge eye-opening experience and that is why i think culture definitely matters when you're reading scripture because you know 
the, the Bible wasn't written to yeah. America. It was written to yes. the Jewish world and, and to the Greco-Roman world. Okay, so number four is what cultural aspects are setting below the surface? What cultural things are there that are below the surface? They're not talked about, but you know that they're yeah. there. It's yeah. like a, that underlying um, that thing that's being said, but it's not being mm-hmm. said. Okay, number five, how are values such as honor and shame influencing the story? Honor and shame are huge in the Jewish culture. Yes. And it wasn't, and it's not just, um, you know, honor and shame on you personally. Like in America, we see shame as on the inside, like, oh, I'm so ashamed of this. But honor and shame in the Jewish culture was a community thing. You brought honor to mm-hmm. your family or you brought shame to your family. And so upholding that position of character meant everything yeah. because if you do bad stuff, it makes your whole community look bad. It was always plural. Yeah. It was rarely singular. Right. Right. So we, we always have to remember that when we're reading the scripture too. And the last one is what assumptions are we making based on our own oh. cultural lenses that may or may not be accurate in mm, this story. That's so good. What part of what I experience in life as an American am I trying to push into this story? Mm-hmm. I think it's important that that we yeah. we recognize that we our culture was not around. It's extremely different. <laughs> it's it's extremely different. Extremely so different. if if you're going to if you're going to really understand the biblical context of everything, oh, I just hit the microphone. I'm too excited. Um, <laughs> but if you're going to understand all this stuff, you have to take yourself out of the culture that you're in right now and put up, okay, what culture am I supposed to be looking in the lens through so I can better understand yes. what the writer's trying to say? Um, so both of, because um, we actually have two different um events and stories from the Bible that we're going to talk about, but they're both in the New Testament and they're both in the time that Jesus was alive and walking on the earth, which means we're looking through a Jewish cultural lens here. Okay. And so I want to go back and and kind of dip in the historical lens for a second and talk about the Jews versus the Samaritans, because that is the um, battle of the centuries with them. They hate each other. Um, I actually grew up thinking that the Samaritans were just looked down upon by the Jews, but it's so much more than that. Like there's hatred in this relationship. They cannot stand each other. And so let's go back a bit, okay, and explain a little bit of why the Jews and the Samaritans hate each other oh so much, okay? And so this is like way back in the day, back whenever the Assyrians conquered the kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, okay? The Samaritans called themselves the children of Israel, right? And so what ended up happening here is the Jews were actually taken, right, by the Assyrians. For 200 years, they they were gone. They were taken away. But there were some some of the Jews and pretty much Samaritans that were there. Wait, is it? Yeah, so so it's it's okay. So Israel and Judea. Yeah. Were, were different were different countries. So Judea was was taken. Into but what captivity. ended up happening is yeah. that the Samaritans that were in Israel kind of yeah. started infiltrating migrating Judea, down. right? And so um, what ended up happening is 200 years later, the Jews came back and they're like, uh, skirt. Who are you? What are you doing? You're not even living the Jewish life right. You know what I mean? Like all this kind of stuff. Why are you in our place? Yeah. And so the Jews are like, well, we're going to rebuild the temple, right? Um, And so the Samaritans are like, we want to help. And the Jews are like, no. And then like literally it's just been pretty horrible ever since. And there's also huge differences in um, the – okay, so the things with the Samaritans and Jews, one of the main things that they fought over – was the site that they believed God chose for his dwelling, right? So the Jews believed that God chose Mount Zion in Jerusalem, right? And the Samaritans believed that God chose Mount Gerizim near Shechem, okay? And so it was like a huge debate, and it was pretty much like, no, we're the, we are the children of Israel. No, we are the children of Israel. Like, it was very, very messy. And so that's yeah. how it started there. It's ugly. Ugly. Very Ugly. Yeah, so if you're if you're really understanding the cultural context of, of scripture right now, we, we always know that there there are two main stories that kind of highlight the the Jewish relationship with with Samaritans. Mm-hmm. And um, and we want to talk about both of those. We're just gonna quickly touch on them because here's the thing. We we don't we're not up here trying to g- just do all the legwork 
for, for <laughs> we want you to read this yeah too. <laughs> we we want you guys to go and and dive in on this stuff that we're talking about and just really dive in for yourself and really study it for yourself because we are capable of error i mean I, i'm capable of error just just like the next person but the thing that's cool is we just want to touch on it and just kind of scratch the surface to what this really looks like so that then you can go and dive in even further and the revelation can become real to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, so I'm pretty sure, Aubrey, I can't remember um, sequence-wise which one happened first, the woman at the well or the parable of Good Samaritan when Jesus said that. Do you know? Because I was thinking we could do it in sequence, but honestly. Yeah, we didn't prepare remember. that. We didn't prepare that well, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just, I know, I know that Luke, yeah, I think it's Luke 10. Yeah. Yeah. Is, and this is John 4. So. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, 4 comes before 10. Okay. So do you want me to go first? <laughs> yes. We'll just do that. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the woman at the well, and she was a Samaritan woman, right? So Jesus and his disciples were headed to Jerusalem, and you have to go through Samaria, Samaria to get to Jerusalem. So, of course, the disciples are like, oh, gosh, here we go. These stinking Samaritans. We can't stand them, right? And so they get there um, to Samaria by um, where the well of Abraham and... Um, Jacob and all that was right and so Jesus is like hey y'all go into town to get some food I gotta sit here I'm really tired and so what ended up happening there is there's a woman at the well and actually it says that it says pretty much that it was at noon because it said the sixth hour or something like that and that's noon because usually it starts at six o'clock in the morning six hours right and so it was hot the heat of the day and the fact that this woman was coming out in the heat of the day was already kind of weird because um people figured that she was actually an outcast. So she was an outcast of the outcasts. So <laughs> well, I think people I think people knew that she was. That's why she went to the well at that time. Yeah, to, because to get away. She yes. was already marked. She was willing community. to go in the heat of the day just to like not have to deal with women ridicule. gossiping about her yeah. and ridicule ridicule so jesus says to her give me give me water you know what i mean they start having this conversation so the first thing that we need to know about jesus is he came to literally just trample on all the religious mindsets that the jewish people had and it did not go well um mm -hmm. obviously as you can see those spouts that happen between jesus and the pharisees on the regular and so something that happened here is jesus asked her for some water so the fact that he even spoke to her is a huge deal okay because by tradition a rabbi would not speak with a woman in public not even his own wife people okay it says the strict rabbis forbade a rabbi to greet a woman in public a rabbi might even speak might not even speak to his own wife daughter or sister in public there were even pharisees who were called the bruised and bleeding pharisees get this because they shut their eyes when they saw a woman on the street and so they'd walk into walls and houses <laughs> like that they weren't playing like okay and so jesus the fact that he was talking to a woman was already a big deal and not okay but the fact that she was a samaritan woman took yeah. it so much further so literally like it's crazy and so something here that meant so much when i read it whenever jesus said give me a drink and then um it said some people might imagine that god is most glorified when he, uh when human participation is most excluded right because god's perfect he can get, do it perfectly we just mess things up right but it says yet jesus did not diminish his glory one bit by asking the help and cooperation of the samaritan woman and so I just love that mindset. And they kind of go back and forth. And Jesus ends up saying like, hey, I know everything pretty much that you've ever done. And he tells her mm. that she's been married to five men. The man that she's living with now is not her husband. So she's like, wow, surely you're a prophet. And there's this conversation going back and forth. And Jesus offers her the living water. And, um, and, and you know, all these different things. And for a second she thought like, oh, real water? Like, I'd love to have that water that you'll never thirst again. <laughs> you know, and it's just back and forth. And it, uh, Jesus ends up telling her that he is the Messiah. And she is, in fact, a Samaritan woman is, in fact, the first person that Jesus in, looked at and said, I am the Messiah. Like, is that not crazy? A Samaritan yeah. woman. Well, and, and the, the, the other cultural thing that you have to add in there is not only is Jesus considered a rabbi, like a teacher, but she's a woman, she's a Samaritan, and she's also consciously living in sin. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, she's been divorced however many times, you said five times, and then the man, and he even Jesus even tells her to her face, the man that you're living with now is not your husband. So there are three 
disqualifying things yeah. right there <laughs> in that one passage to where culturally it doesn't make sense for for Jesus to talk to her. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let alone use her to minister to the entire village, right? Because after yes. she leaves, she goes back into town and she tells everybody, I just met the Messiah. And, and she's just on blast. The same woman, right, who, who just went from hiding and going to the well in the ho- hottest part of the day to avoid ridicule is mm-hmm. now walking through the streets confidently, uh, just telling the whole the whole town that she just met the messiah and i think it's i think it's awesome because it just shows the the culturally you know empowerment that jesus came to empower those that had no power and and something something really quick before you go to the good samaritan something that was really interesting to me was jesus started speaking to her right and she could tell by his dialect the way that he spoke and the way that he dressed that he was a jewish man right And so she kind of challenges him by bringing up the huge issue between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so she's pretty much like, well, we know that God is here on Mount uh, Gerizim, right? I said that really stupid, but you know what I mean? (laughs) So she tried to bring up this issue that, you know, Jews and Samaritans deal with on the regular. But Jesus literally, like, pushed that to the side. He didn't, like, he said, oh, no, like, trust me, you're going to be worshiping the God in spirit and truth. It don't even matter where you're going to be. Like, and Jesus took it to a whole new level because he's like, this, these piddly issues that we deal with, that's going to be no more soon, you know? And and I just love that because Jesus had this mindset, like, yeah, this is what it looks like. I understand. Like, so many people, yeah, I worship God. God dwells here. No, God dwells here. Either way. We're about to all worship God anywhere because he dwells within us, Mm. you know? And so I just thought that was so amazing that he literally pushed this giant issue that creates, makes people hate each other. And he's like, yeah, doesn't matter. Like, I wish we were like that, Yeah, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Like let the main thing be the main thing. You know, a while back, there's so many different kinds of theology Mm -hmm. out there. If you'll, if you'll branch out just a little bit, you'll notice that there. (laughs) The, the kind of theology that you believe in, there's probably a hundred different others mm-hmm. that are almost like yours, except for a little bit different. And, oh, it's, yes. and it's very interesting because I finally got to the place where, uh, you know, the gospel is simple, you know, saved by grace through yeah. faith in Jesus, through repentance of sins, right? It, it's simple. And so if we can come to the table on that, mm-hmm. uh, on that statement alone, then everything else is is objective Mm -hmm. i feel like as long as we all know that we can't save ourselves that we can only be saved through christ the living water as the woman at the well found out um and you know through repentance because jesus always told people he would heal them and set them free from stuff but then he'd say go and sin no more Mm -hmm. so we need him in order to you know sin no more but uh i think that I think that that is an incredible cultural lens to look through right there with mm-hmm. with the woman at the well is understanding that in that time period culturally Jesus was not even not going to talk to a woman like that in the in the mm-hmm. rabbi standards he shouldn't have and she disqualified herself on every lens yeah. culturally because of who she was where she was from and her lifestyle but understanding that culture helps us understand the grace and the mercy of Jesus that much more. It, um, for that culture, looking at the situation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, it is cringy. Like, they would be like, oh my, I can't even look. I cannot believe he's doing this right now. Yeah. Oh my God. Like, that's, that's how much this situation, it wasn't just like, yeah, that's awkward. You don't know that lady. You know, it's so much yeah. more than that, people. You're not at the fountain in the middle of the mall in, in America. Like, this is this is a big deal. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So the the other, the second story, oh, right? Oh, I'm sorry. This is John 4, but we will write that. I just yeah. wanted them to know. Yeah, that'll, yeah. Be, that'll be in the comments or in the in the whatever you call it. What do you say every time? You're the show put, notes. Show notes. There Boom. it is. Yeah. This is the greatest show. show. Um, okay. So the... The, the Samaritan in the Jewish contrast has always kind of interested me. And so we, we have the Samaritan woman at the well. And then Jesus in Luke chapter 10 tells us a story where, where we, the lawyer comes to him and says, uh, you know, how, 
Jesus basically is talking to this lawyer and, and he says, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? And then, so then this lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And so Jesus begins to tell this parable of the Good Samaritan. And I know that we've all probably heard this story before, but I kind of want to break it down because the cultural framework around the Good Samaritan completely blew my mind mm -hmm. as I was preparing for this. And so in, in, in that world, in that time, we're going to break it down to culture right now, okay? So in that world, the only way that people knew where you were from mm -hmm. is how you dressed and how you talked. Yes. So the, the Bible tells us that there was the, the man was on the road, right? And, and the robbers came out and they beat him. They left him half dead. They took his clothes out. I, I'm, ima I'm imagining that this guy was sharply dressed and he was probably somebody. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't, you know, you don't want to beat somebody up and, and take you sneakers with holes hobo. in them. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> like you just don't do that. So I imagine this guy had had some, some wealth to him, but the, the Bible doesn't tell us that. So they, they strip him down and they leave him, they leave him for dead. And they take his garments because those two things, the, what you wear and your accent tells everybody where you're from. They tell whether you're a Jew, whether you you're are. a Samaritan, whether you're... Uh, you know, wherever you're from. And so uh, the Bible goes on forward to tell us that, uh, you know, a priest went by, a Levite went by. and But here's what's interesting. Um, the priest comes riding by on a donkey because in that time, if you were a priest, you had elite status. So you didn't walk anywhere. You came, you, mm -hmm. you, were, you were riding on a donkey. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that this priest was probably coming back from teaching the mm -hmm. Torah somewhere else and was and was coming back to town. I mean, these are all assumptions that I'm kind of making, but they they could be they could be true. Well, you know what's crazy real real quick. Another crazy deal. Jesus walked everywhere and he was a rabbi and he yeah. was, like so that was another contrast that Jesus did yet again. Well, and that was, was the usually... only time when Jesus came into town and he told them yes. to go get the the colt, mm -hmm. you know, for him to ride in on that. Yeah. Was, yeah. So, so the, the priest is, is coming in and the, he, I imagine he's pondering to himself. I, I know he sees the guy in the ditch. The Bible tells us that he sees him and he moves to the other side of the road. If you look at that, a lot of us in America think, oh, well, the, you know, the Pharisees, they were just snobs. And so that's, yeah. that's why he did that. He moved to the other side of the road because he's a jerk and he's full of himself. Um, but if you look at it from a cultural standpoint, you literally understand that um, the, the the priest didn't know whether the victim was dead or if he was even an, a non-Jew or mm -hmm. anything like that. And we all know that according to the Bible, in Jewish customs, you're not supposed to touch anything that's dead or you're defiled and you have to come back for purification. So here's the difference. The, the priest is not wanting to take the risk on touching something that's dead. Because I think that he was coming back to town, and and he wanted to ride back into town in uh, in glory or in honor. In honor. Yeah, we yeah. talked about honor <laughs> and shame at the very beginning of the podcast, and so he wanted to come back in riding in honor. But if he would have went and touched the man and found out that you know it was a dead body, then he would have come back to town in shame and had to set himself apart for purification. He would have had to have quarantined himself. Uh, for for yeah, purification yeah, purposes, like in Leviticus, you know all this. So stuff. he didn't, and and according to there is a there is a uh, Pharisee um, book that I looked up. I, I forgot how did I pronounce that. Jordan is called Sirach. Sir um, Sirach. No Sirach. Yeah, Sirach. So this is a book that basically tells you how the Hebrew customs went. And so I was looking on there, and according to that book, the the risk is too great for that priest to go and check on that man because if he's dead or if mm -hmm. he's a non-Judean, then, you know, he's, he has to go into quarantine. You know, we all hated that. You know what I'm saying? And, so. and you know, like Aubrey said, it was literally like it was shame or it was honor yeah. in his eyes. So yeah. he's like, oh, I'm not going to deal with yeah. that. And that he, bring me shame. Yeah, he said, I, I can either ride into town in honor or I could ride into town on shame, you know, and so... Uh, he he bypasses. So then we get to the Levite. The Bible tells us about the Levite. He comes next, and you know the the Levite may have even gotten closer to examine the victim, even though the road was not straight. The Levite very likely saw 
that the priest responded in that way and moved to the other side of the road. And so, you know, if the priest didn't give first aid, then why should the Levite, right? Yeah. And these these are all things that you have to ask yourself. Um, and and so, uh, sorry, I just lost my place in my notes. So if the priest didn't give first aid, then then why should the Levite? That would challenge. That would be a challenge to the priest and an insult. So, so if you again, see, shame. <laughs> yeah. So then again, shame, right? So if the priest bypasses this man on the road and doesn't help him, then it would be shame on you if you're the second one and you stop to help this guy after the or, priest didn't. Or wouldn't it look? Wait. Oh, I thought it meant like it would look bad on the priest if the priest didn't help. It would. Yeah, it'd be an insult and, to him. Okay, therefore, yeah. it looked bad on you. Oh, yeah. I get what you mean. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so then. Finally, the Bible tells us that we have the Samaritan in this, and the Samaritan comes along, and it's a it's a shocking character in this story. And I imagine that when Jesus was telling the story, Jordan already said that Jewish people and Samaritans they hated each other. Yeah, it wasn't they, even like looked down upon. Like, no, yeah. I hate you. You're literally yeah. Worst. Like it was like yeah. I I don't even want to be in the same room with you. I don't even want want to walk yeah. on the same road as you. And so here's the Samaritan, and uh, you know. This is a hated enemy, but he is the first one to feel compassion for the man in the ditch. And, um, and so it, it was kind of a, they use the word, the Hebrew word that related to womb describes that inner gut feeling that the Samaritan got when it came to that. He had that inner gut compassion that comes along. And so he offers first aid. That's what the Bible tells us, which would have been wine, oil, and bandages which the Levite could have done but neglected to do. The Samaritan's risk is that the victim might hate him upon waking up. Because if he's a Jew... Nobody in this story knew the nationality of the man in the ditch because he wasn't wearing... He, his clothing was gone and he was unconscious. They couldn't hear the way that he talked to understand what nation he's from or understand where he's from. Mm -hmm. And so these are all cultural clues that are, that are hidden in this story mm -hmm. that, that are sitting here adding to how good the overall story is. And so uh, the Samaritan is, is wrestling with the fact of if this dude wakes up and he finds out I'm a Samaritan, he's going to hate me for helping him. Well, because it like, sounds crazy. Well, like you said, even like the, his first aid stuff would have been unclean for this guy. Yeah. If he was a Jew. Yeah. The, like, the, the wine, the yeah, wine the Samaritan from the Samaritans, wine. the oil, the bandages, all of it would have been considered unclean to Jewish standards. So the Samaritans even taking a risk in helping him. And so we, we have that. It's kind of one of those things, you know, the old saying, you know, danged if you do, danged if you don't. You know, so, <laughs> so it's like if, if he helps him, then the guy could wake up and be completely mad and, you know, want to kill him for helping him because he's a Samaritan. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so, for them, it did. Okay. Right. Cultural. <laughs> it, cultural. It made <laughs> sense for them. And so um, the Samaritan then does what, what the priest could have done but didn't. He places the victim on his animal mm -hmm. and takes him to an inn and continues to care for him. So... Um, the Samaritan, in contrast to the robbers, promises to return and pay any additional expenses to the innkeeper yeah. for, for this guy's medical care. But here's what's interesting: if you understand, if you understand the the culture, um, this is the most foolish part of this story. Okay, because if the victim should die, his family, who would not be able to find the robbers, may kill his benefactor instead. So the Samaritan even puts his life on the line to help this guy because if he dies, the innkeeper can point to the Samaritan and the family could go and kill him and they would have every right to do so. No greater love. No greater love. So, so, the, so the Samaritan literally mm -hmm. not only putting his money, his wine, his oil, his bandages, his animal on the line paying for this guy's in stay but he's also putting himself into a position where if this guy dies i'm done mm -hmm. like his family's going to come after me and they're going to kill me and so uh or if the victim survives he may rage at the samaritan for making him impure with samaritan wine and oil so it, it's kind of like a he's he's tossing a coin here but the it's it's the important part is Jesus is talking to the lawyer the whole time in this. 
Jesus tells this whole story mm -hmm. and, and paints this picture. I imagine the lawyer is of Judean descent as well because he would have been despised at the fact that there was a Samaritan in this story. But it finally gets to the end. And, you know, Jesus flips the script on this lawyer. And, and so the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? But what Jesus was telling this story for was to get the question flipped around to who should you become a neighbor to? Because the lawyer's a smart man, so he obviously knows that the Samaritan in the story did what was right. Mm -hmm. he, he did was, what was right in the, in the eyes of God, and so therefore he said, well, of course, you know, who's, who's the best person in the story? Well, the Samaritan is, and Jesus is like, yeah, so instead of saying who is my neighbor, you should say who should I be a neighbor to? And so it just completely flipped the script. But if we, if we take the cultural lens of that story and we, we look at the story as the culture calls us to, right, understanding the, the way that priests worked, the Levites, and understanding the relationship between the Jewish people and the Samaritans, it brings a whole new level of understanding to what Jesus was trying to say to the lawyer whenever he was teaching that story. And it's it's yet again the most crazy thing, the parable of the Good Samaritan. That would be an oxymoron for the Jews because there's no such thing True. as a Good Samaritan. But Jesus yet again, like he always does, flipped the script and he made the Samaritan the hero, right? Yeah. Like he actually made the Samaritan like Jesus. That's exactly what Jesus would have done. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. He put his life on the line for us right and so the Samaritan was the Jesus of the story yeah. and I promise you because he was talking to Jews his audience while Jesus was saying this he was talking to Jews right because Jesus was there to teach the to teach the Jews yeah. and they were probably like oh my gosh no he's doing it again that whole thing with Samaritans I can't I can't even but th there's another thing that happened right before he told this parable, the Good Samaritan. I kind of wanted to read it because it's short, but it yet again shows another picture of how the Jews and the Samaritans dealt with each other in the most ungraceful ways, might, might I add. But this is it. it this is um, in Luke 9, and it is verse 51 through 56. So this is um, called Samaritan Opposition. At the t um, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he said, um, then he and his disciples went to another village. So what happened here? The sons Why? of thunder. So, yeah, yet again, Jews and Samaritans hate each other. But did yeah. you get this one? It said, but the people there did not welcome him, Jesus, because he was heading for Jerusalem. So they were going, the Jews were going to the rightful place of the dwelling of God, right? But that's not what mm. the Samaritans believe. They're like, why you keep going? He's right here. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, you think you're so cool and you're so good. And you're, you know what I mean? Like all this stuff. And, and Jesus got mad because <laughs> James and John are like, those little idiots, like literally like, yeah. rain fire down from heaven. Like, wow. Talk about about like that yeah. if that doesn't show you i really don't think they were overreacting in their mind like that's how much these people hated each other yeah and they wanted they wanted <laughs> sodom and gomorrah to happen again to each other like believe me yeah well what was that one thing you read aubrey like all these people that um the jews hate and then like samaritans didn't even count as a people like yeah they're just literally the worst like yeah what were so you reading? In, in that in that book that's what that's what i was talking about in uh in the uh sarah or oh, sarah's Shrosh. 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 Well, yeah, we're not biblical experts by any means, so just <laughs> try hanging in here, hang in here with us. So um, in, in this, this is how Hebrews were, were to act in, in the, the um, Pharisees. And so the inhabitants of uh, Sierra and Philist Philistia, oh, oh, my whole being loathes two nations, and the third is not even a people. Guess who the third is? Yeah, the inhabitants of Seir and Philistia, the Philistines, right? And the foolish people who dwell in Shechem. A.K.A. the Samaritans. Who do you think hangs out in Shechem? The Samaritans. So the third, they're not even a people. Uh, according, to even Jewish, according to Jewish standards, they didn't even count them as like humans. It, it was it's it, kind of... 
Wrong. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing. Like Jesus literally flipped the script on religious judgy mindsets. True Think that. about like there are so many aspects that Jesus totally like just butchered this little Sarash. Okay. Like Jesus yeah. is like Sarash my butt. Like, okay. Maybe not, but yeah. like, honestly, like it felt like that. Sarash. That's the book. If you want to look it up. Whenever we're reading Sirash. the story of the good Samaritan and Aubrey was saying some of the things that he found out about it, like the, with the priest and the Levite, the only thing I heard was fear of man. Oh yeah. They had fear of man. Yeah, they didn't want people to think bad of them because fear of man. Like, over and over again, like, oh, the Levite was worried that the priest would yeah. do something fear of man. The priest didn't want to walk in town in shame. Fear of man. Like, that's well, all it was. Yeah, it even, it even t- take it back to the disciples, right? When they come back to the well and they see Jesus they're conversating like, with this what woman. What is he doing? They're like, why, why are you talking to this woman? Because they were afraid of what it would look like if yeah. people saw Jesus talking to this woman. Yeah, and Jesus is like... I don't care. <laughs> Jesus is like, I do what I want. <laughs> like we've got to yeah. be like Jesus people. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hope that, I hope that this little bit kind of opens your eyes to the, to the lenses of understanding, like, uh, blah, 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 understanding <laughs> the cultural lens of yes. looking at the Bible. And, and I think that it just brings so much more depth into everything. And like how it, it makes me realize that, Jesus and Paul and all of these wonderful writers that we get to li- we get to read and, and we get to follow along their story how how genius it was mm-hmm. in everything that they did being Holy Spirit led Jesus literally would flip the script on anybody but in order for you to turn the tables on it you have to understand how it was first Mm -hmm. you know and i think that's what the cultural lens does to scripture it teaches us how things were and that's why it makes it so much more incredible what jesus did it's so true and and like we said this ebook um is amazing it's gonna be in the show notes there you go you're learning (laughs) <laughs> but um, so next week in yeah. part three, we're going to be going over geographical and how that lens can change yeah. your mindset um, in the context of how you've always read certain yeah. chapters of the Bible. Absolutely. So we're really excited about it. And we hope that this kind of opens your eyes about how much Jesus literally was. Yeah. What well, and I think gangster. at the end of at the end of all this, after we go through all these lenses, I can't wait to have Brad on. Oh my god! It's gonna be awesome. I'm I'm probably just gonna be sitting there listening the whole time, just like We're you guys are. We're not gonna say anything. So it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> We're just gonna be like, go yeah. Brad. <laughs> yeah, go Brad. Take it away. Take it away, sir. Um, but anyway, thank you for joining us today. If if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. Our yes. social media pages: Instagram, Peace of Authenticity, and Facebook. Um, yes. Just let us know. Join in on the conversation and. If you need prayer for anything, we'll, we'll, we'll always mm-hmm. pray for you and for your family or whoever. Um, just let us know. We want to be on a journey with you, not just not just here mm-hmm. on a journey and then you guys are kind of watching. We want we want you to come with us. Come yes, with us. Yes, yes. And um, our t-shirts are still for sale and they will oh, yeah. stay for sale until July 15th. Oh, yeah. And so if you want to get your order in, that will be in the show notes. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Well, it was fun this week. It was so fun. We will see you next week right here for the Geographical Lens. Have a great week. Bye, guys. Hey, say bye-bye. 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 Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Oh, okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>